Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, my guest is Matt Hansen. He's a doctor of physical therapy, clinician, emphasis on manual therapy techniques and women's health. I want to welcome to my show, Matt Hansen. Hi, Susan. How are you? I'm fine. And, you know, we've had another show that we've talked about some of your programs. And before we move to the program that you're working on now with um, with regard to vitality and, of course, uh, diabetes and arthritis, I, I would like you to tell our guests a little bit about Freedom to Move Home Exercise Video Program because even though we talked about it in the past, I think some of our audience didn't hear you. So let's tell them about that. Oh, fantastic. Uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a physical therapist. And uh, I do some professional writing as well for some uh, medical magazines. And one of the articles, the publisher asked if I could do a meet the author phone call uh, with some of the readers that were very interested uh, in the article that had been written. It was about adapting exercise. Um, and when I was on the phone call, one of the questions that I received was one of the, the readers asked if I could recommend a, an exercise program for people who couldn't do many of the popular mainstream videos. Uh, we're all aware of those, you know, the P90X and Insanity and and uh, some of those exercise videos, which are fantastic for a certain population, but they really are designed for a pretty slim population. And many of those exercises, which are very high impact and difficult on the joints, shouldn't be performed by a number of people. Mm-hmm. And I took a week and, and I looked for a, an exercise video that could be was more adaptable. And the only thing I could find was two extremes. On one hand, I saw the videos which are um, the high impact, which I've, I mentioned, and then on the other extreme, I saw some videos that um, were simply somebody sitting in a chair and doing arm circles or reaching for the sky, which, again, for a certain population uh, are fine, but it's a very limited population, very slim demographic. So I wasn't able to find anything. and got back to that reader and that participant. She actually challenged me to come up with a program, and that's what Freedom to Move is. It's a program that's adaptable to anybody, regardless of their age, uh, physical ability, um, or their fitness level. You know, Matt, you mentioned that it's an opportunity that a lot of people of all ages can adapt to. Um, Why is it important to put an exercise in your daily life? Well, exercise is important for so many different reasons. Um, Not only the the physical benefits uh, from exercise, uh, but the, the psychological benefits as well. Uh, when we exercise, our, our brain releases, our body releases endorphins. Um, we release different hormones, stress, uh, anti-stress related hormones, which help us to feel better about life. It's a positive cycle. It's a positive circle. When we feel better about ourselves, we want to be more active. We want to be around people more often. When we don't, and when we're inactive, when we're inactive, we start this negative cycle going. We Many times we seclude ourselves from other people. We become more sedentary, and that brings all the secondary effects of not being active uh, as well. So there are many benefits, obviously, of, of being active, and it doesn't necessarily – that there are a lot of misconceptions of what exercise really is as well. A lot of people think that if they're not running in a, um, in a 5K or a marathon or if they're not down at the gym, you know, five nights a week, that they're not exercising. That's simply not the case. Yeah, so um, is exercise the only thing that somebody should do, or is it important to really think about their diet, too? Because without um, without a good diet, um, I'm afraid that um, people will really get obese, and, and that's really one of the big crises in, in, this, in this country, at least. It's true. Um, a balance is extremely important. Diet is, is a huge part of that. I've, I know a number of people who will exercise and exercise and exercise every day, and they work up an appetite, and then they'll go down and, and they'll, you know, hit the fast food uh, place on their way home. Um, that's not going to help. <laughs> we're just, we, we sweat for all those hours and, and uh, burn these calories, and then we're putting them right back on. 
So it's important to understand what you're putting into your body and, and not just what we're doing with our bodies, but understand what we're putting into it for fuel. You know, that's difficult because we've all been raised kind of in a fast food generation. Um, and, and so many of our foods have artificial ingredients, corn syrup, uh, and things like that, which are just empty calories. Um, it really takes a lifestyle change. You know, Matt, uh, it's it's really um, very difficult for most people to fight this this crisis of eating um, fat foods and also uh, sugar because so many companies in this country really um, they they're powerful and they send messages to people that very hard to um, to to avoid. Now, if you had a chance to talk to say McDonald's or one of the other companies that produce some of the sweets that we see all over, um, what would you say to them? Uh, you know, that's a tough question. That's great. Um, you know, I believe in free enterprise, but what I, a lot of the legislation that has occurred recently I think has been very beneficial. For example, those restaurants are now required um, to make uh, it public knowledge at least what the calorie intake or fat intake um, is on the different products. I think it's very beneficial. We need to be educated consumers, but we still have the right to choose. You know, if somebody chooses that they want something, that's wonderful. I mean, if, if somebody decides, hey, I really feel like a Big Mac today, and that's what I really want. They have the right to be able to choose that, but they also have now the knowledge of knowing what it is and what it what it's you know costing them. Um, there's an interesting program by the name of the Healthy Weight Commitment, and it's put together. It's a nonprofit organization, and it's actually sponsored by some of these larger corporations, and, and including PepsiCo, and I believe Coca-Cola is a part of it as well. And and the whole premise behind it is educating the consumer about calories in and calories out. You know, they're saying the message isn't that you have to abstain from from these things if you want a sugar soda. Um, you know, there are differing opinions on it, obviously. But they said understand what it is that you're consuming and understand what the that when you take in a certain amount of calories, we need to find that balance. The calorie in, calorie out balance is really what it's all about. And when we start consuming more calories... Uh, than what we can burn, then that's when our body starts storing it and converting it into fat. So what are some of the most prevalent health conditions that can affect someone's vitality? Well, you know, speaking about fast food and and eating habits, one of the largest ones in our country is obesity. Uh, Approximately 90 or 69 percent, excuse me, the government uh, has reported approximately 69 percent of our population, adult population, is either overweight or obese. And obesity brings a lot of different comorbidities, what we refer to as comorbidities or secondary health problems with it as well. Um, Approximately 9, just over 9% of our population, adult population, lives with diabetes. Um, Almost as as many live with heart disease, just under 9%, approximately 8.5%. So, you know, I'd say being obesity, overweight, and some of those things that can come along with it, Probably number one, far and beyond. I'd say second, secondly, arthritis. Um, 16% of adults live with arthritis, and those who are older than 65, uh, approximately 50% of the adults experience arthritic, arthritic pain. Now, our, the way that we live today um, requires that we sit at a computer a good part of the day, and also we don't go out in the field like they did, of course, 100 years ago, where they had to work from, oh, the early morning until late night. So how do we how do we deal with that situation where people have to sit at their computers, they they work very late, they eat poor food. What what would you say to them? Uh, we need to incorporate it into our normal day. Activity or exercise needs to be incorporated um, so that it becomes part of our, our routine. And it takes time to do that. You know, we need to set the habit and we need to continue with it until it does become part of our lifestyle. Um, ways that you could do that if you have a desk job. Um, allowing yourself time to get up and take a walk or during your lunch hour, walk and eat, you know, or walk to the restaurant where you're going to be or pack your own lunch even better because then you can control exactly what you're consuming, walk down to the park, you know, and walk back. So um, there are also different ways to do desk exercises or to incorporate things into our day. I have an extremely, you know, as I as I get along and I have my family's growing and my business is growing and I become more and more busy as well, 
I've had to find ways to incorporate exercise into my evening routine. So my wife at first made fun of me because sometimes I'm doing exercise while I'm brushing my teeth or while I'm watching the evening news. Um, but then she started doing them with me. <laughs> you know? So I've noticed that she's start incorporating it into her routine. So it's finding a way that works. Um, I'd also say that you know being social is important because doing exercise with a friend, people are a lot more likely to do it if they're doing it with someone that they enjoy spending time with, whether that's a family member, a friend, a coworker. Um, and then you kind of hold each other responsible. When you know that somebody is depending on you to take that afternoon walk or that lunch hour walk, you're a lot more likely to do it and less likely to find an excuse. Yeah. And now uh, let's get back to the the issue of obesity. Um, how can someone who is obese and possibly experiencing related secondary complications maintain their vi- vitality? Uh, I'd say first and foremost that they need to, if they are stuck in a cycle, and I, I'd say, unfortunately, too many people who are obese they become reckless or non-social. Um, now, that's certainly not the case for everyone, um, but I see it happen too often with those people who feel um, discouraged with their situation. They feel that there's not anything that they can do to improve. Um, they will, rather than going out and being more social and being active, they stay at home. They're, sometimes the TV becomes the best friend. Um, it is, you know, it's normal to feel self-conscious or when you're not feeling good about yourself, but it's important to reach out to others or at least remain active and, and not cocoon. Um, secondly, I'd say find support groups. You know, I have a great story about my brother who he topped out at, he had a, a, a big problem after he finished college and lost his support group. He came back home and um, he gained a lot of weight. He topped out at over 400 pounds. Whoa. And as he did, he just got into this cycle. He wanted to go out less. He didn't feel attractive. He didn't feel um, that he had anybody to really relate to. And he decided he had to do something to change. And so he actually went and tried out for The Biggest Loser, the television show. And he wasn't cast. He wasn't selected. But he stood in line with thousands of you know, people for hours. And he started talking to them. And he met one group that was in line that they they jogged. Um, they walked and jogged kind of a combination, and he he got involved with them. And they helped to motivate him in ways that our family couldn't, you know, because he'd heard the message so many times from us. Josh, you're not eating healthy. Josh, you're going to have a heart attack. Josh, you're going to get diabetes. You know, he'd heard all that, but to him it was just us harping on him. Uh, it wasn't supportive. He felt that we couldn't identify with him. But when he found a group that he could identify with, it was very motivating. Now my brother's lost half of his body weight. He weighs just over 200 pounds. He runs at least three half marathons a month. Um, sometimes he'll do a full marathon, and and he motivates others. Okay. So you know you need to find that support network. Find others who can identify with you, but don't don't push away those who are trying to be encouraging. Sometimes people you know they say things out of love and out of um, try to be encouraging, but sometimes they say the wrong thing. They don't know what to say. They just see that somebody is in a difficult spot. So that would be the second thing is, is finding some, you know, a like-minded uh, group or support group. Uh, you know, Matt, I, I just wonder whether some people overdo it and the dangers that may be uh, the result of doing too much. But is there such a thing as doing too much? There is. In fact, I refer to it as the zero to 60 uh, syndrome, where people will go from a standstill and then they get motivated and then they come out and they start doing a lot of exercise and they either burn themselves out or they cause an injury. It, you know, 80% of people who have a gym membership in our country, they quit within within five months. Um, most of them will quit by February. You know, most of the gym memberships are signed up for in January. You know, everybody with the New Year's resolutions, uh, they're excited, they want to start the year, and then come a month later, they they're burned out. So it's important to realize what your limitations are and to ease into things. You know, being active, and what I said earlier about there being misconceptions about what exercise really is, we need to understand that for some people, just going through your daily routine, doing the laundry, cleaning the house, that's exercising. Exercise is work, and if you feel that you're working, if something is taxing on your body, you're working. And and building it up, easing into it, and then starting a regular routine, whether it's an exercise video program like Freedom to Move, 
whether it's going to the gym, whether it's starting a, a walking group in the park, whatever it may be, we need to ease into what we're doing and realize that anything that we're doing that was more than we were doing the day or the week or the month before is a positive effect. Hmm. Now, is there a difference between the kind of exercise and the kind of diet that uh, men and women uh, partake in? Uh, should a man do more than a woman or a woman do more than a man? Which one works the best for uh, each gender? As far as as far as diet? Correct. And also uh, exercise. Well, I'd say as far as diet, it, it really, you know, I subscribe. Um, to kind of a common sense diet uh, is what I refer to it as. Um, you know, I, there are certain things, for example, when when I believe in certain foods in moderation, um, I believe that certain foods, that as long as you're hungry, they're they're good to eat. I call it my A list. My, my M list is my moderation list. And I do have an X list. Some people don't have an X list, but my X list are, are foods that I, I just stay away from um, for my particular diet. You know, I think that it's important because there are so many other factors that come into play, including diabetes and things that you need to learn and get to know your own body. Um, I do not subscribe to the, what I refer to as extreme diets and or fad diets, and we see them. Every couple of years, there's a new one that pops up, you know, whether it's no carbs at all or whether it's all protein or whether it's high fat or low fat, you know, and it seems that, that the fad changes every couple of years where, to me, it's all about balance. Um, because if you're you're too extreme and if you're only taking in one type of, of energy source into your body, then your body starts lacking other things. Um, so that's what I recommend is that people find that balance. For weight loss, it is better to do something like that if you're doing a no-carb diet or something, but that what we see happen too many times is people will lose pounds and then they put them right back on after they've you know, finished their diet or they can't hit that maintenance level. Other body starts craving other foods because it needs other foods. It needs other nutrients, et cetera. As far as differences between the genders, um, I'd, I'd say, you know, there are some differences. Sometimes, you know, nutritionists will say that uh, men may need uh, additional protein um, because of the muscle mass. Um, but women need protein as well, obviously. It's very important. Um, other than that, I, I'd say it's really more individual and more than it is based on gender. Now, let's get um, back um, to the the, yeah. the issue of arthritic pain. Now, someone living with significant arthritic pain, how do they maintain vitality? Well, with arthritis, you know, it's, it's interesting because depending on where the arthritis is affecting, it can be a very debilitating uh, condition. Uh, many people were seeing more and more total joint replacements in our country, total hips, total knees. And the great thing is is that they they have wonderful techniques now that just offer all kinds of options to people that weren't there beforehand. Even 20 years ago, it used to be that an artificial joint would only last for approximately 15 years. So people that were getting it were being told, hey, you're probably going to have to have another total joint replacement again, you know, another 15, 20 years. That's not the case any longer. Uh, with, the, with the hardware that they have now, it lasts for a long time. So that may be an option for somebody who's who's suffering significant uh, arthritic pain and what we refer to as weight-bearing joints, so your hips and knees. Um, there are other ways, though, that you can take that weight off. Losing weight is always effective. If somebody is overweight, you know, working on losing weight can, can um, relieve all kinds of stress off the joint. But as far as exercise itself, doing exercise in other types of envir environments, what we refer to as low-impact exercise. So not jogging. Walking may be okay, but not jogging, not jumping, those types of things. And the pool is fantastic. Doing water aerobics, wading in the pool, swimming. Those things are wonderful because the buoyancy um, effects of water help to take a lot of that weight off of the joints. So that's a great option, as is biking or recumbent biking, which is kind of that biking where your feet are out in front of you and you're sitting down in more of a reclined position. Now, we we talked about arthritis and of course diet uh, obesity, but um, let's talk a little bit about a physical therapist. Um, most people know what a physical therapist is, but I want you to really explain what you use to help people who are experiencing pain in their back, pain in their their legs. You know what is really a physical therapist's job? Sure. 
Um, well, our primary responsibility when somebody comes in is to first assess what the problem is and where it's coming from. There are all kinds of things that can cause back pain. Um, so we'll do a full assessment and really try to determine um, what's causing that and if we're the best professional to be addressing it. If we determine that it is something that needs to be addressed um, possibly through surgery, we'll try some some more um, conservative uh, treatment methods first to see if we can help to reduce that pain and refer somebody back to their doctor. But a lot of times the physicians now are trying the conservative treatment through physical therapy before deciding on surgery or something else. Um, I would say, you know, another primary responsibility of, of that therapy or of a physical therapist is to establish a home exercise program for someone and to make sure that they're independent with that program. Uh, the problem is, is too many times a physical therapist will just hand somebody a piece of paper and they'll say, here are your exercises. But they haven't educated that person. They haven't explained to them why am I doing three sets of ten of this exercise. You know, what is it helping me to do? And and one of the biggest complaints of therapists is noncompliance. You know, they're saying my, my patients aren't doing their exercises at home. I'm only seeing them two to three times a week. There's no way that I can help this get better if I'm only seeing them two to three times a week. They need to be doing these things at home, which is true. But if they haven't done their job and helped to educate that person and given them a program that can progress, so that what happens after these exercises become too easy? Or what happens if they're too hard? What can I do? You know, and that's one thing that I, I really believe is part of the therapist's job. But unfortunately, you know, we don't see um, done with all therapists. It, it's not universal, I, I'd say, that, some, that our, our therapists are really doing that right now. But yeah. um, we're really trying to help people to become independent, and that's the key word, I think. Now, also, one of the things that we haven't spoken about is genetics. Is there improvement and uh, lots of advances in physical therapy and the way in which you actually do your job? Um, with genetics? I'd, I'd say there are some promising things on the horizon, pr principally, in uh, neurological uh, rehab. So somebody who has had a spinal cord injury or somebody who has had a brain injury. Um, there's a lot of research that's being done uh, with genetics uh, there. As far as um, orthopedically, so somebody who, who has the arthritis or things like that, there are also some things that are being done trying to regrow collagen, uh, which is kind of the barrier or the protection of the joint in between. Um, but as far as affecting the way that we are treating people directly now, I'd say their personal genetics, yes, but as far as the experimental and things that are being done, that are being done, not so much yet. Now, if you were to give our audience some advice in how to keep healthy, what what's the last thing that you would tell them? I'd, I'd say, you know, my, my personal mantra, which is keep on moving. Um, it's important to just keep on moving. Set those goals, but don't become a st uh, discouraged if you're not meeting them. Set goals that are realistic and and set milestones. Don't just set an end goal, but you need to set milestones. So And celebrate those milestones. You know, Celebrate them along the way and recognize what you are doing good. Uh, it's important to celebrate what you can do. Don't focus on what you're not able to. Because there are certain things just with age that we're not going to be able to do anymore that we used to be do, do when we were younger. But we need to celebrate what we are able to do. We need to celebrate um, those who are around us and, and the people we can spend time with. And, and you had mentioned, Susan, a trip that you recently took to Jackson Hole and Yellowstone. You know, those are fantastic things. Those are things to be celebrated, to be able to get out, to walk down to the lake or to take a hike or, or just to enjoy nature. Um, we're meant to enjoy life. And, and I think we you know, we focus too much on the negative. Well, Matt, it's been a pleasure having you on the Susan Brender Show. Um, just so that our audience knows, um, Matt Hansen is a doctorate of physical therapy, and he knows his stuff. So thank you for being on my show, Matt, and uh, come back soon. Thank you, Susan. And I'd like to refer everybody also, if they are interested in learning more about the Freedom to Move program, they can visit our website, which is Freedom to Move. It's the number two. So freedom2move.org. Um, we have completed our full strengthening series, uh, the DVD series. Um, we'll be working on a cardio program soon. Thank you again. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sdbrender at yahoo.com.